All right, aloha. Um, this is the traveling doctor coming to you again. And aloha. This is the traveling doctor coming to you again. I am, I don't know, I'm done with one week of uh, working in the hospital. I'm taking care of a few COVID patients. And yes, I'm wearing a white coat today. I rarely wear it, but it's laundry day and I'm not wearing pants right now. <laughs> so it's been a pretty long week, but I have not had a bad um, kind of COVID experience like my New York friends have. Um, again, can't mention specifics, but let's just say again, Hawaii is doing really, really well as all of you probably heard compared to the other states. Um, again, this is a late podcast, so I'm going to sort of do more, kind of jump all over the place and sort of answer a few questions that a lot of you have asked me about uh, what's going on right now. Um, the major thing, uh, well, there's two things. Uh, one has to do with drugs, um, which was remdesivir, um, which I talked a little bit about before with Gilead. And um, a drug or treatment I would want to focus on a little bit is uh, plasma, because a lot of people don't really know what that means. And uh, it's a pretty kind of hopeful therapy for COVID-19 coronavirus. It's been a little nuts. Um, as you can tell, I think all over the world, people are getting super, super antsy right now. Um, yeah, just very, very um, annoyed, a lot of cabin fever. Uh, obviously, a lot of you saw the uh, protests come up, um, the stay or don't stay at home protests, I guess you would call them. And uh, that sort of came on the heels of Trump um, <clears throat> and other world leaders saying like, yeah, well, we can start ramping up um, reopening of certain parts of society, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three. And I'll go over that. Uh, a little bit, but essentially, Hawaii is one of the best uh, states. We have the lowest uh, per capita number of cases for COVID nineteen. We have the lowest number of uh, or second lowest number of deaths per capita, as well as I mentioned. So the problem is, is it's all really come back. And I guess I'll start with the testing because everyone's asking about. The antibody testing and um and i've talked about the antibody testing for a while now again just to summarize we all know the nasal pharyngeal test is that quick one that everyone has gotten or a lot of people have gotten um <clears throat> the test that they are looking at um is the antibody test the one where they draw the blood out now when you draw the blood out uh you again look for that igm and that igg I think the controversy right now is there are a lot of people who are saying that, well, maybe the IV or the IgG, IgM, the antibody test doesn't really tell you whether you have immunity or not, um, number one, uh, which is a legitimate point. I mean, we've always assumed, and for a lot of other diseases, you can assume that you get IgM and your IgG, and then when you get your IgM, sort of actively infected, but when you get your IgG, you're uh, immune from whatever disease. And, you know, the more that's gone on, people are swearing than me have said, that's not necessarily a guarantee of the case. Um, and so that's something we have to watch out for. So basically, even if we get a really good antibody test, uh, we may not have uh, a lot of good information from that. Uh, I mean, on, if you want to be aggressive, you could say that everyone who has antibody tests and tested positive for IgG should be able to do everything they want. Should be able to go travel, should be able to go work, should not be able to get sick, um, all these sorts of things. Um, and that is not clearly true. Um, we don't know that because we don't have enough long-term data. We don't know, we would have to test that again too, like all the research studies. We basically have to take people who tested antibody positive, IgM, IgG, and then put them out 
back out into the community, you know, like let them go around and control that and see how many of these people start to get uh, symptoms again and maybe test them later also for, uh, you know, nasal pharyngeal uh, COVID-19 by PCR. Um, that um, is obviously a very tough study to do because we don't even have enough people who've tested for the nasal pharyngeal uh, swab. So my point is that antibody tests may not show that we definitely have immunity, which would be a bummer because if we don't have immunity, then um, that, you know, we would be making decisions based on the antibody test that may be kind of fatal for us or not fatal, but just we would reopen society way too quickly. And society and countries would think, oh, well, you know, this whole population and antibody positive people are, are not going to get COVID-19 again. Um, and maybe that's not true. <clears throat> that goes to the other tests that, um, or the other article. Uh, hey, what's up, Jan? Welcoming Janet in from California again. So that goes to the other article that a lot of people sent me was that a lot of people who got COVID-19 tested positive again. And COVID-19, uh, and a lot of people ask, well, what does that mean? If you get COVID-19 again uh, for a second time, does that mean you'll get sick again? Uh, I don't know. And again, I mentioned this last time. I mean, some of these people who got COVID-19 the first time weren't sick. So does it mean they get sick the second time? I really have no idea. Does that mean that they can pass it along to people? Again, I don't really have any idea about that either. Um, uh, you know, that's the difficulty with saying you're positive again by PR. So we don't have enough tests that have been done. Um, and, and we don't know what those tests mean. Um, <clears throat> Greg, okay, Greg's checking in. So Greg asks, and Greg, I was going to segue into this. <clears throat> um, Greg asks, did they fix a false negative problem on the newer, faster tests, lower the percent of false negatives? Greg, uh, it really depends uh, which test you're looking at. Now, I read, and you may have uh, seen a lot of these studies that have come out where they did the antibody test in LA and in Stanford, and they said that there was a huge percentage, something like, you know, 50,000 people or, you know, 10 to 50 times more uh, people were probably infected by COVID-19 based on antibody studies. Now, there's a lot of reason those statistics might have been off. But to answer your question, those standard tests and the LA tests for the antibody tests use good tests. The best test should have like a 95 to 97% sensitivity, um, meaning that if it's negative, you really don't have antibodies. Uh, you know, and that's a good sensitivity test. Test has good specificity. That means, you know, uh, something a little different. That more has to do with the positivity of the number of uh, positives, you know, and whether those positives are truly positive or are they falsely positive. So, Greg, to answer you, um, I don't think they fixed the problem. And part of the reason they didn't fix the problem is that the U.S. government, the FDA, allowed by emergency authorization, the same way they allowed um, Ford to make ventilators and, you know, clothing companies to make masks and different things. They let pretty much anyone um, do the antibody tests. But in fairness, there are only a few. I've heard like only four real antibody tests that are better. So that's the other very good point, Greg. Not all antibody tests are the same. You're going to have to be very careful when you see these antibody tests rolled out everywhere because honestly, every clinic is going to try to make some money off of this. This is really bad, you know, because you're going to have to ask, well, which antibody test is this, you know? Yeah, they can draw the blood and everyone assumes that your blood tests are just right, right? I mean, if they're wrong, that's a huge problem. If your blood tests say that, um, you know, you have uh, no antibodies, but maybe you did have antibodies. And in other words, the sensitivity was really low. Uh, you know, I was reading statistics that something like some of these tests have a 70 to 80% false negative rate. Now, remember the PCR tests, those are bad. Those had, those had a 30% false negative test rate. So some of these antibody tests have 70 to 80%. That's horrible, right? Seven to eight uh, out of 10 negative tests, in other words, weren't negative. They might have been positive. 
they were really positive. That's a horrible antibody test to take. Um, Danielle shouts out from New Zealand. Oh yeah, Jen. Yeah. So you guys get a better sense. You know, I still didn't clean this up. I just gelled it and it's not as good here. Again, you can see the back of my head. It's not great, but it's not awful. So <clears throat> yeah, that's my haircut. I am wearing that white coat today. Um, this is my official uh, uniform for when I do telemedicine. So Danielle, congratulations to New Zealand. Um, and I've heard different things about New Zealand and Australia. For example, Australia is starting to open up their borders, or not borders, I'm sorry. They're starting to open up their beaches, but similar to Hawaii where they're letting people do water activities, but not run along or, or, uh, or not like sit there. I'm not sure exactly what it is in New Zealand. Um, that's really good. So for example, Danielle, you guys are down to five cases in New Zealand. Hawaii, for example, we've been slowly going down. We're not as low as five, but we're only down to, we're down to like, I think less than 10. Like we have only eight cases. We had like 14 then 12 then 10. And um, <clears throat> Australia is doing well too. So again, like I said, they're slowly, Australia and New Zealand are sort of doing their version of phase one before America. And again, what did they do that was a little different? Well, number one, they have a geographic advantage by being more close off, but they still have big cities. Auckland's a big city, Sydney's a big city, uh, but they were stricter about things for sure. And they were stricter about, as Danielle has mentioned before, about no takeout and, you know, being really strict about where you could travel to. So, you know, that is very uh, uh, a different thing overall. But here's the problem with our phase one, the way they're describing phase one for America. And again, everyone wants to get in phase one, right? This is why they're having the, the uh, don't stay at home protest. Okay. Good night, Jen. This will be uh, saved again on Facebook live or my Facebook live. And um, I'm recording a much better video on my phone, which I will uh, put on YouTube. I think the quality will be better on my phone. So um, anyway, um, the problem is, is that in order to get to our phase one, Trump and the government and probably most of the governors, because Trump is leaving it up to the governors, believe it or not, have to show 14 days of decreasing cases. No state has shown 14 days of decreasing day, uh, cases, and none of them are going to show it by April 30th. So certain states have already delayed or uh, put, you know, forward the uh, stay at home thing to like mid-May or even later. Um, and then on top of that, we have to also that like hostile resources are going down and not going to be overwhelmed. And I forget what the third part is, but it's strict. So U.S. is not going to get to do it. And we're all jealous already of New Zealand and Australia and even Germany and is doing a little bit stuff. I think they're opening up like hardware stores or something. And Denmark is opening up kindergartens, like I said. So Andy asks, it appears SARS, um, our COVID can get in the brain. From what I've read, loss of smell, taste might be the symptom of this. You think the risk of brain damage is Andy again? This is all all very speculative. I've you're right. A lot of people, including one of my good friends Brian, um, has no smell. I don't think he got it back. Um, and uh, there's a fun fact about um, olfactory nerves or uh, nose uh, uh, smelling nerves, and I'll describe it a little bit later. Amy, thanks. Work was kind of busy, but I didn't have a lot of uh, COVID problems my whole week. Again. COVID, uh, I've had a lot of COVID rule outs. So rule out means like, oh, they're coughing, they fever, they have some pneumonia sort of thing, and we're worried about them. So we treat them like they have it until we get the test result back. And our test results have been pretty good. They've um, uh, gotten back within about uh, a day or so for us. So Andy, to answer your question, um, uh, the smell, I think some people bring it back. And the reason why smell is affected is Number one, it's one of the most sensitive nerves. It's a direct nerve into the brain. All the other nerves, like your eye nerves, your hearing nerves, even your, you know, um, your facial nerves, uh, all your cranial nerves, there are like 12 cranial nerves, all of them require two jumps or uh, at least one jump. And the olfactory nerve doesn't have any jumps. It goes straight into the brain. So why does it affect that? I don't know. I mean. Could there be some brain damage later, Andy? Uh, it's possible, but we obviously, again, unfortunately, I, and I hate to sound like a broken record, we don't have a lot of data to study that. We probably have to take people who are positive COVID-19 and lost smell, and maybe also a cohort that didn't lose smell, but were COVID positive, 
and then see down the line, you know, give them like mini mental status tests or uh, personality tests or different things to see if there is some sort of brain damage or something. My sense is that there's not going to be, I would worry less about the brain damage. Um, and I would worry a lot more about the lung damage because seeing a lot of people have lung scarring and lung damage. And even the people who get off of the ventilator, again, the ventilator survival rate is really horrible. Uh, I, I had a very, again, fortuitous update by my really, again, my, my contact in New York who works a lot with these, um, doctors or uh, with the COVID patients, he takes care of 40 patients, 40 patients that's uh, in his ICU. And again, they're very, very, very sick, but he says it is falling there. Um, um, their rates are falling. And so, you know, uh, things are getting better overall. Now he says, and this will lead into my discussion about rem uh, desivir. but again, to summarize, the antibody test is going to be very, very important. It has always been very important. But our problem right now is you can't make the good ones fast enough. And it's almost the same problem we've had for everything, for the pharyngeal tests, the uh, PPE. Oh, by the way, they're starting to run. Some states and some cities are starting to run really low on the reagent. It's not just like they stick the cube up there and stick it in a machine and it reads it. You have to mix it with a reagent. It's got to be red. And labs are starting to run out of that. So at some point, they're running out of the swabs, they're running out of the reagent, they're running out of all elements of the test. So, you know, we need everything and we're behind in everything. So it's a manufacturing problem right now uh, to talk uh, with Greg again. So I want to go a little bit uh, about remdesivir. Again, I talked a little bit about it last time and I've talked about it all the time. And that's the major drug that's being pushed, uh, you know, and my friend, he mentions that they use remdesivir for the sicker patients. In other words, the ones that are intubated and very, very sick in the hospital. Because again, he thinks there are two phases of this disease. And I kind of agree with him that there's a viral phase, which is the milder phase. You can think about it like the normal lower symptom phase, like the fever, the cough, where you feel pretty run down. And a lot of people are thinking, and there's not a ton of proof for this, but a lot of clinicians are treating it where you are treating that as the milder phase where you give hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and, uh, uh, you know, consider even um, antithrombotic stuff. Uh, antithrombotic meaning blood uh, thinning stuff uh, in order to prevent clots because a lot of people end up going on dialysis. That's another thing they're seeing. Now, people are going into a lot of failure. Now, you can go into multi-organ failure from a lot of infection, a lot of sepsis. Um, and not just COVID-19, but COVID-19 does cause people to go into failure. So, my, uh, you know, my friend will say that they will use things like um, uh, uh, remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin maybe a little early on. But remdesivir, again, is an IV drug because it can only be given in the hospital. And then they'll use possibly other things, the other harder drugs to get that are still hard to get, like Act Actemra or Toclizumab. Uh, try to say that a lot fast. Toclizumab, um, T-O-C-Z-L-I-M-U-B. And um, again, those that's for the more cytokine phase, the phase where everything is starting to just get fried on all your organs. So again, a lot of doctors have started at that point where they think that there's those two phases. Um, you know, so, but again, Gilead, the remdesivir studies, which are the ones we're studying, have all the um, good prelim data. But again, the data is all prelim. It's not placebo controlled. It's small studies, but some of the studies look excellent. They look like, you know, again, they did like with 130 people in University of Chicago Hospital. And by the way, this someone snuck out a video. The actual ex, uh, study and the data aren't out yet, but someone snuck out a video. And again, Gilead, which makes remdesivir, their stock went through the roof. So it's really, um, um, you know, it, it's hopeful. And there's a lot of hope, as I mentioned last time, but there's definitely no um, uh, guarantee that this will work. And again, unfortunately, the problem I see with these drugs, remdesivir, Actemra, anything besides hydroxychloroquine, is that 
Well, what does it do? It only treats people in the hospital, right? Who are the people in the hospital right now? The sickest people, the people um, with, um, uh, you know, uh, more severe symptoms, hypoxic, uh, pneumonia on the x-ray or CAT scan, or severe is considered less than 94% on your oxygen saturation when they measure your oxygen. So my problem is, is that even if Gilead like helps everybody, right? Even if it got a hundred out of a hundred people off of the ventilator or Temra did it, even if all of it did it, the problem is it doesn't prevent people from getting into the hospital, right? And that's still a problem because these drugs, remdesivir, Actemra, uh, favipiravir, uh, Kevzara, all these different medications that are all immunological medications or um, uh, antiretroviral medications, they can only be given IV. You can't pick it up from a pharmacy. So that leaves us with, again, hydroxychloroquine. And I beat that to death. I've told you a lot about why hydroxychloroquine is possibly not that good. By the way, more data come out where they've stopped studies studying hydroxychloroquine because the data doesn't look good and people are getting heart arrhythmias um, on hydroxychloroquine, which is really bad because that was always one of the things we worried about. Now, you know, I've said before that if you only take it for a short amount of time, you may not get side effects. And in fairness, a lot of these patients were taking azithromycin too. So it could have been azithromycin, not hydroxychloroquine. Because azithromycin, which is ZPAC, also causes problems with the heart. And you know what? Maybe these people were just having rhythm problems anyway. The, this is why we need placebo studies. Because we don't know whether even the placebo people might have had some heart problems. And if they had like, you know, 15 out of 100 people in placebo study and uh, 17 people out of 100 in the hydroxychloroquine study, had you know heart problems then they're equal and there is no real effect and no real heart problem from hydroxychloroquine but we haven't really done this study so um again my problem with all these great drugs that everyone is hoping for that are not vaccines are that you know we cannot use them to keep people out of the hospital and we can't we can maybe keep the death rate down but we can't use it to keep people out of the hospital which is what we really want to do um and so, you know, what can do that? Again, it's all the social distancing stuff. And a lot of people are saying, well, we didn't need as many ventilators in New York. We didn't need uh, that many um, uh, hospital beds. We didn't have as high a mortality rate or as, as many cases. And again, I'll post up that graph. But again, as a lot of people have mentioned before, the reason why things look so good and people will say, oh, well, we didn't need to do it is because we did do it. And we didn't keep hitting that peak that we did flatten the curve. That's why the numbers go down. And of course, a lot of people will say that, well, how can you prove that? You're right. We cannot prove that. We cannot go back to alternate universe where none of us digital distancing. Uh, someone brought up a chart. I think it was Andy that showed that, uh, for example, um, um, Sweden, uh, or I, I don't know if it was Andy. Uh, I think another one of my friends um, Raymond brought up a chart that showed if you do case adjusted um, um, by per capita population and look at cases, Sweden, which did very little social mitigation and, and self social distancing, um, has a very similar and lower rate than the US, which did a lot. And so the argument is, oh, well, maybe Sweden, um, you know, shows that you didn't need to do it and it would have been the same in the u.s whether we did it or, you know um oh yeah thanks jan i uh I, I i gel it up because it does get a little shaggy i didn't really clean it up that much um so again like of course all the protesters are out there and i understand why i, I mean i don't think all of them don't believe in the coronavirus and that it can be cause death and cause sickness. I think a lot of them do. I think a lot of them just think this is an overkill and an overshoot of, um, um, an overshoot of uh, uh, you know, government control. And they want some people to get back to work and that they think that they don't need masks, that we should be like Sweden. And the reason my point is I, I think Sweden, it worked because people follow the rules. And I don't wanna be mean, but I really don't think Americans follow the rules unless 
we have people ticking us all the time and regulating, and that's why our police are a little bit more aggressive. Um, Jan, yeah, to answer your question, so is China having a peak now? They're not having a peak, but they're getting second cases as they open up. Actually, the country, I wanted to mention this, I'm skipping over, I'm doing sort of the drugs and the world thing and the tests all together, but the country I would look at most now where I'm most worried that was ahead of the ball and doing really well is Singapore now. Singapore has their second wave. Uh, you can look at that uh, 91divoc.com, 91divoc, it's COVID-19 spelled backwards. Look at those charts and look at Singapore. Singapore looked like they were flattening out and getting ready to go down and then it suddenly hit again. So their second peak looks really bad now again. And they are tracing all the problems with their peak in um, second peak and second wave uh, to, uh, believe it or not, a lot of uh, uh, migrant workers, in workers. Because if you go to Singapore, they have a lot of people who come to work from poor Southeast Asian countries, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, Malaysia. And um, a lot of these workers live in really cramped, like think about a hostel that's super cramped, like the size of like an apartment building, you know? And this is where migrant workers live. So Singapore, which is doing a really good job again, had all the rich people and uh, good mitigation and do, was doing well. But again, they had to open up some part of their economy and they did, and now they're hitting their second peak. So this makes me worried about all the states that are opening early. You may have heard some Florida, is opening their beaches again. It doesn't look like it's as bad. By the way, some of the fake news uh, uh, articles try to use old beach pictures of like California, other stuff, make it look like everyone was walking forward again. And that's not fair because that's not true. I mean, they were opening it up, but not, it wasn't as crowded as they make it look. So I, that's why I don't like some things like Yahoo News and uh, other places. And welcome to Daniel. Daniel's coming in from LA again. So Daniel, I'm in the middle of talking about how states are opening up like Florida and Georgia. And I was describing to Jan, who was worried about the second peak, that uh, whether they're worried about a second peak in the US. And I said, yes, because look at Singapore. Singapore was really flattening out and it looked like it was even gonna just come flatten out, like Taiwan did, like South Korea did. And Taiwan and South Korea are still okay for now. South Korea's getting a little bump, but Singapore is bam. So right now, the country I would watch is Singapore and maybe South Korea and Japan. Japan. Japan is also doing bad. They never really finished their plateau or flattened their first curve and they just started going right into their second curve. So Japan's curve is looking bad and Singapore's curve is looking bad. And the states I wanna watch now are New York, of course, because New York is just the most hit state and we'll see what they do in terms of opening up. I think they'll be a lot less aggressive. And then Georgia, second state I would look for, and then I would look for um, Florida and how they're doing with opening up their beaches, right? And maybe Hawaii too, a little bit. Um, yeah, Greg, so Greg mentioned Sweden also has a healthier overall population in the US, way less diabetes. Way. Yeah, you see, so <clears throat> Greg, you know, I brought this up to my friend. Everyone loves to use, like even my friend Danielle, and Danielle, I love her and I love New Zealand and Greg, you know New Zealand well, but people love to say, oh, well, New Zealand was this perfect model and you know, why can't we just do it like New Zealand? That's like comparing Iowa or maybe not Iowa, but uh, like Guam to New York, you know, or something like that. You can't really compare uh, a state and a city that has 11 million people in a four mile, you know, long and two mile wild, wide radius, a tiny space, 11 million people to, you know, uh, a country like New Zealand that doesn't even have one third of that, you know, or barely a third of that, a million people or something. And there's three times as many people in one city. So my point is, I've always said that we have to look at states separately and maybe certain states, you know, like, that's why they are coordinating, like Governor Cuomo is coordinating New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, everything. And, um, you know, Washington, California, Oregon are all doing their own thing. So, Greg, good point. You know, uh, uh, Stockholm is not as dense. I, I know you've been there too. So Stockholm and Gothenburg are, are just not the same. And the culture is different. And you're right. They have a healthier population. They don't have as many poor 
overweight, minority people with diabetes, everything. And, and you can really a very good point, Greg. Daniel mentioned LA County announced today 4 to 5% of the county's population antibodies and less fatal to 0.2% instead of 4%. So Daniel, I talked about this at the beginning of my podcast with the antibodies. The, um, you know, that may be a big overreach. They're extrapolating based on their numbers. LA County tested something like 3,000 people and they may be right. So they may say that it's fatal to 0.2%. And for example, comparing to the flu, the flu is generally 0.1 to 0.2%. But I mean, you could say the same thing about the flu, right? How do you know the percentages for the flu? You only test the people who come to the doctors and the hospital and are sick with the symptoms, right? I Maybe the flu is not really 0.1%. It's like 0.01%. If you test everyone in the population for flu, asymptomatic, like you, me, nobody, you know, everyone who doesn't have a cough, maybe the flu isn't even 0.1%. You see what I mean? These are all statistical games. So they may be right, but it doesn't, it doesn't negate the um, fact that certain countries and like Italy and New York, they weren't lying about the deaths flooding in. My friend who takes care of ICU patients is not lying when he said, 40 people were ventilated and all of them died. I mean, I've worked in ICUs and ventilated people for a long time. I've never seen an ICU where when you're ventilated, the majority of people die. Like usually we get more than more than half off of the ventilator. I would say even as much as 66% or 70% get off of the ventilator. It's only the truly sickest people that die. So that's the other thing where people are saying that, you know, the ventilators, uh, or, uh, you know, maybe the numbers are, are fudged because in New York, they tested all the dead people or even the possible COVID-19. Again, that may be true, but again, you, you could have said the same thing about your normal flu season or swine flu or any flu, that if we tested everyone asymptomatic, see what I'm saying? These are all, and this is why I don't love studies and statistics and stuff like this, because you kind of make it sound very clickbaity and make people say, oh, well, you know what? We don't have to worry. There are a lot of asymptomatic people. You could look at the same study result and say the same thing, right? You could say, oh, well, uh, that means that we don't have to worry. The mortality rate is not low. I would say it's the opposite. If so many people are asymptomatic, we have to worry about all those people giving it to the uninfected people. You know, even if the numbers are high, a major part of the population of the world in America hasn't been Affected. Okay, let me answer more questions. So, said, my friend in Singapore says in Singapore they pass laws fast since it's just one city. If you're the house apartment without a mask, you have to go find meet up with someone. Yeah, you take it. Yeah, so we all know Singapore has a lot of strict. So, even though they're going really bad with the second wave and the migrant population uh, infections, they can throw down stuff real hard. They just have to figure out their migrant. Problem again, I think unfortunately they didn't focus on the poor people. And this is similar to New York, who are the sickest people and the people who are dying are what populations? The poorest ones, the immigrant workers, or the immigrant workers, or the illegal immigrants, or the obese people, that kind of thing. Singapore, again, remember, is a country that when a kid spit uh, gum, you get in jail. When he did graffiti, they had a kid in America like, ten, like 20 years ago who was caned got six lashings by a cane as American because he broke their laws. Amy, so what do I think about the projected soft openings? I don't, I know yet. I think, you know, we can do some in certain states, but we need to be very strict how we do it. We, soft openings with phase one would be appropriate for certain states, possibly Hawaii, but I'm gonna tell you, Hawaii people do not want anyone coming in. We like what's going on, even though our un unemployment is 37%. 37, more than one out of three people. It's like if you're in a class and you look right and you look left, one of you is unemployed in Hawaii. It's insane. We have the highest unemployment rate in the country. Um, it's something like 250,000 people. I mean, that's really bad. So Daniel says um, that means more people are walking around infected, walking around as in carriers. Daniel, yeah, you know, again, we don't know. They could be carriers or... Um, you know, it's hard to say because again, what does a PCR tell you? It just tells you whether you have virus, right? We don't, we don't, I mean, if you're asymptomatic, we say you're not symptomatic. So let's just talk about asymptomatic carriers. You could be a carrier, but does that mean you're even effective? I would argue it, it depends. I mean, 
Maybe you need a certain amount of viral load, but you, I would say, yes, you're potentially a carrier. And so you have all these people, but a lot of like, you know, the Republicans or forget Republicans, conservative, the people just sick of staying indoors are saying, well, you see, this is like the flu. We have so many people carrying it who are asymptomatic. Let's just all go get sick. But that's not how herd immunity works. And I really don't like also that term herd immunity because it's making it sound like we're cows or something. And it really has to do with you need in order to get community people going, you need people to be immune, right? The problem with being immune is that the only way to be immune is to get the disease and hope that you survive it. If you develop the antibodies, then you can develop the immunity and give it to the population or the people, populist immunity, instead of herd immunity, I'd like to call, or societal immunity, you know? So that's the problem is that I think that's bad. If everyone is asymptomatic, just say, hey, we're all going to run around. Those old people, what are they going to do? You know, are, are, are they going to, uh, and the immunocompromised. I mean, you can say there's an argument, we just lock all those people and don't let them come out until we get the vaccine. But <clears throat> it's still dangerous. And it's, it's, it's kind of a reversal of what we're doing right now. Um, so Daniel, uh, uh, Janet says, good night. Okay, good night, Jan. Thanks for checking in again. <clears throat> so, um, I know I have a cough, I'm fine. I had a little bit of sore throat a couple days ago when I started work and I got worried, but it went away. Again, you know, most people getting upper respiratory infections or cough or whatever, it's not COVID-19 right now. Again, I've tested, I can't name specifics or whatever. I tested something like more than probably like 10 people this week. Zero, zero of them with the symptoms sick in the hospital had COVID-19. Again, it must just be Hawaii, so who knows? We can't compare New York to Hawaii. We cannot compare apples to oranges. We cannot compare you know, New Zealand to Italy or Sweden to the US or anything like that. That's really unfair. So you know, it's not a race. It has to do with what we're doing. So Daniel asks, wondering if my girlfriend has antibodies and then could have infected me. Um, Daniel, that is very possible because you mentioned your girlfriend got sick first got better and then possibly gave it to you. So it's hard to know. And then even if you both took a good antibody test and you're both positive, does that mean that happened? Your girlfriend got sick, got antibodies and better and then gave it to you, you got sick and then got antibodies? Possibly, or it could have mean that you got it a long time ago, both of you and were asymptomatic and this recent sickness was something else, parimixovirus, coronavirus, no coronavirus, rhinovirus, anything else. You see, that's the problem with interpreting these results. Even if you have a good antibody test, Daniel asked, um, "If is developing herd immunity for animals like having chicken parties, or is that a cruel form of Darwinism?" Daniel, I did mention this. To you. Amy, you're right. It's probably <clears throat> some allergies. I did have a little sore throat again. It all went away. I didn't even take my zinc. Towel. I busted out my small <clears throat> little bag of halls. I was about to take some of these. I didn't even take those. So, you know, you're right. Most things being equal, common thing, or it's probably allergies or another upper respiratory tract infection. So, um, Daniel, herd immunity for antibodies. You can think of chicken pox parties as a quick, painful, not recommended version of doing that. Herd immunity means more that not really that, it's an oversimplification. Herd immunity or societal immunity, like I'm gonna start calling it, is uh, saying that like a certain amount, let's say you have 90% of society is immune. However they got immune, whether they got sick and got immune with antibodies, or they got a vaccine, like for measles. Measles is a good example of herd immunity, societal immunity. And then um, the, um, her, the point is that you have now 90 to 95% of population that is immune from this, however they got it, from vaccine or because they earned it, if you will. And then that other 10 to 5% is so spread out that they don't run into each other. Think about it like a club, right? If you're in a club, 100 club, right? And, you know, every only one out of, or five of 10 out of 100 people were immune uh, then there are 90 people could give it to each other really easy if only one person went in that room. But if you have that same club with 95 people are immune and only five to 10 people 
are not immune, then if that one infected person comes in that room, what's the chance that he's going to bump or shoulder that uh, uh, naive person? That's what herd immunity and societal immunity means. It's not trying to get people sick intentionally. That's the awful way because, again, you may get in a room, even if it's 0.1% in a room of 1,000 people, right, like one person's going to die. One person in 1,000 people in that, you know, uh, COVID-19 party is going to die when he doesn't have to die if he could just wait for the vaccine or do something else, yeah? So Daniel mentions, um, yeah, Stephen, uh, I talked about this antibody test and the Stanford test uh, very early. I'll, I'll go over it again, but I, I, you should watch the first uh, maybe half hour of my uh, 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 talk. I know you came in a little late, uh, but I'll, I'll summarize it. But I want to answer Daniel's uh, 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 question first. So he mentions he tested negative PCR but felt and feel some residual symptoms, and you can't find an antibody test. Should I take the PCR test? Like false negative. Daniel, I wouldn't take the PCR test again right now because there's limited utility in it, right? If you have minor symptoms, it's very unlikely that you will test positive this time. Uh, you'll probably just get another false negative. You know, there's not because the, the PCR test tests viral load. It doesn't test whether you had it or not. The antibody test does. And as I mentioned, a lot of the antibody tests are very bad right now. 70 to 80 percent false negative, even worse than the PCR test. Uh, I would only get a legit antibody test at a high sensitivity, 95% or above, through a major academic institution like Stanford, or a major hospital that's using it or something. So, um, Gennady, Stephen, I, 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 I told all this, yes. Oh my God, <laughs> guys, I really wish you checked in early. I, that's why I talked about the antibody test, yes. The antibody tests are all overreach clickbait. I hate when this happens because it's a poorly, uh, you know, what's the impl impl implication? Basically, the implication is that so many people tested positive by the antibody that were asymptomatic that, that we don't need to worry about it, that a lot of people are asymptomatic, have the antibody, and that may be true, but they're extrapolating that advice. Uh, it's a really, a lot of statisticians came out and they 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 trolled these guys uh, and said it's a really bad article a really bad statistical uh uh significance and there's not that much significance the confidence interval is really wide and you know um and 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 are, are you know not really uh maybe not i'm using that wrong but essentially it, it's very variable you know it could have meant that there's a low amount of, uh, or high amount of people in the population that are asymptomatic antibodies. But in, in a nutshell, no, it doesn't really help us at all, okay? It doesn't at all for us. Because, okay, even if that's true, even if a majority of people have antibodies, what can you do for that from a public health standpoint? Just extrapolate and say that, you know, for example, it's not new news. This antibody test, look at the first antibody test in Iceland. You know what the Iceland test showed? The Iceland test showed that um, the Iceland test showed that um, uh, up to 50% of people that they tested who were asymptomatic actually had COVID-19. 50%. So that's what they were finding in Iceland, you know? Um, so this is not a finding, it's just different numbers. So Stephen says what he saw, okay, maybe I read the wrong Stanford study, but he saw what he saw basically said that even at those numbers, we are nowhere near herd immunity. I think you mean immunity, not hear immunity. Um, yeah, no, Stephen, it's the same uh, study. and it, it just extrapolated it the wrong way. They said that too. They did say that, but the problem is the mainstream media I hate to use it because I sound like a Trump supporter. I mean that in the kindest clickbait way because we know even Fox News, CNN, Yahoo News, they all use clickbait titles and pictures. And the idea that there's so many of these people have uh, immunity, it, they're right. Because again, the tests, even if you extrapolate the numbers, it's still a small percentage of people that have been, um, even if you say, all those people had antibodies that represents a minute portion now what did i say again 
you need to get herd immunity. Well, you know, you may not need 90 to 95%. I mean, the more you have, the better herd immunity works. That's societal immunity works. That's, you know, the point. So right now we've only tested a minor portion, less than 10%. I don't think even 5% of America has been tested, right? Uh, let, let me see how many uh, we've done in America. Um, it looks like we've done about 4 million tests, okay? I'm looking at the newest totals. Yes. Right? How many people are in America? Near 400 million. So we have 2% of the population in tests. Even if you extrapolate that and you say 10 times that number of people are, and say half of them, say like even optimistically, half of those tests were really positive, right? Even if you extrapolate it and you say, oh, well, that must mean of that, instead of 4 million, let's say you have 10 times that, 40 million, uh, uh, 40 million, and half of those, 20 million, immune and asymptomatic, 20 million is not even, it's only, what, 5%. Of America, right? 20 million is only 5% of America that's immune. That is not enough for herd immunity. So even if herd immunity were to be a thing or to work, we're not going to be able to use it, guys. We cannot use it. It's hard, you know, I'm even working this out in my head, but that's really the problem, okay? So <clears throat> that's, that's, that's bad, right? I mean, and even if, like you say, Gennady, if you, and you know, if you spread out those numbers, we're in the beginning. How long are they saying before we get a vaccine? The most optimistic thing is in a year, right? Like a year. So if we spread those numbers, and again, how many deaths have we had in America? Uh, we've had uh, we've had uh, total deaths for 40,000 people. Remember, again, in the beginning of March is when our first, I think, death or something. I, I, I have to look this back and double check this, but I remember, right? Our first death didn't come until like the end of February, beginning of March. In other words, it's only in less than two months and we've had 40,000 deaths. Imagine if we didn't socially mitigate and wear masks and do these other things we're doing, how high that number would be in another two months. Uh, by the way, it wouldn't be 80,000. It would be logarithmic and exponential. It'd be way higher. It'd be, I don't know what it is. It'd be like, I, I don't... I, you know, times of, you know, by a factor of four or something, I guess, you know, maybe it'd be more like we'd have 160,000 deaths. I don't know for sure. Again, I'm, I'm not a great statistician that way, but I understand my point. So if we extend it out and out and out, yeah, right. We could have some ridiculous amount die of this before um, we get this vaccine. So, um, um, yeah. So again, Stephen, so the article initially saw this in position of research, meaning that we aren't ready to open. Yeah, and the problem is, Stephen, is that the, the media and everyone is looking at it, and they're, this is what I mean about, you know, doctors interpreting the data and um, statisticians and, you know, um, people who study, like, how do you calculate sensitivity? How do you calculate specificity? How do you, you know, how does herd immunity work? These things, the average Joe just clicks on it. And it's open. I understand hope. Hope is a wonderful thing and it'll get us through this, but it's a really dangerous thing too because hope gives us, uh, 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 you know, maybe uh, a, a wrong thinking about how we should approach the next step, you know? But I agree, I wish everyone read that article instead of the, the journal and the test results instead of the articles that, uh, you know, like newspaper clippings and, and forwards that just make it sound, oh, well, we don't need to worry because we're all, going to get sick and be asymptomatic. You know, that's what I think your typical person is looking at right now. So so what makes us think this vaccine will work when we can't get a vaccine for the cold and this virus in the cold family? Gennady, I again also addressed this in our uh, last, in one of my last two podcasts. It's not that we haven't tried. I mean, they may have tried on some level, but they didn't try really, really hard. Because there wasn't a lot of incentive to make a vaccine for a common cold year where the mortality rate is not very low or not very high. You know, again, even these Johnson, I think Roche and the people who uh, are, are the companies that are making this vaccine, they're not gonna make a lot of money from it, right? They can't charge some ridiculous amount of like, you know, $10,000 a shot. You know, you know there's not a lot of financial incentive 
in just making a vaccine for the cold. And again, like the flu, the type of cold that is more common every year will change. So Gennady, it's not that we think or don't think, we're hopeful that we can make it and it would be an inactivated virus most likely that they have to grow in the right animal model. Again, if you looked at contagion, I think they grew it in, uh, I don't remember what, uh, pig or something else, or it grew initially in a pig and they grew it in some sort of other embryo and then they were able to amplify it, you know? But it takes time. So I'm hopeful, am I 100%? No, no. I, the people smarter than me think that it can happen. So I, the reason why they didn't make a vaccine to the common cold is they would need to make a vaccine every year, just like with COVID-19 or maybe next year it's rhinovirus or next year it's whatever. But, you know, that is not typically killing. People don't die of the common cold as much as they die of the flu, right? And that's why they make the vaccine for the flu, you know? So, um, um, so Ray, welcome, Ray. Um, and Gennady says there's this book called Cold War. So interesting. So I have to, you know, look at that. I mean, look, our worst case scenario, Gennady, if you're right, let's look at the worst case scenario. And um, uh, I, you know, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario, is that we never find a vaccine for this, right? That's the worst case scenario. We try, we try. Every time we think we have a vaccine, it either doesn't work or worse, you know, or doesn't really uh, uh, affect as many people and develop antibodies as strong or it only works partially, you know? Or even worse, it gets some people sick or creates some super flu and or super uh, COVID we all die and become zombies or something, you know? So, I mean, the worst case scenario is that we never really find this vaccine. Then what are we limited by, you know? Gennady, you're right. There are 2,200 different strains of the cold, right? The cold. But they mean that. They mean rhinovirus, parimyxovirus, coronavirus, um, I think respiratory syncytial virus. There's so many. But the point is you cannot make a vaccine. you got to focus on all those, right? Right now, we know we only need to focus on COVID-19, coronavirus that is novel 19, okay? And the, the strains may be slightly different, but the strains only differ slightly. The protein structure on the virus shell may differ slightly, but um, so I uh, Gennady says, I think there are some new modern methods. They haven't funded new big projects to try to cure the cold. Yeah, Gennady, you're right. You're right about that. And the problem is, again, what is the theme been? Have you noticed a theme? Whether it's PPE, what's the problem? We can't produce it fast enough for everybody. What's the problem with the nasal pharyngeal test? It's not that it, I mean, yeah, the 30% false negative rate is a problem, but we cannot produce it fast enough to get to everyone. Again, we tested less than uh, 5% of America, or less than uh, uh, 1% of America, 2% of America. We basically not test anybody. And then the antibody tests, what's the problem? Production, production. Same thing with the vaccine. It will come down to production. And the people who will get it first will be the sickest people, or not the sickest people, but the healthcare workers. Because again, the sickest people don't need the vaccine. They have it already. That'll be the difference. And I mentioned this last time, the rich neighborhoods are all getting um, uh, Fisher Island on Florida, the super rich family, uh, 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 island that has 250,000 average salary. And, um, man, uh, Telluride, Colorado, you all know Telluride. Uh, they got it first. And if you listen to Tom Hanks, he gave it some interesting information. His wife, Rita Wilson, guess what she got? She got hydroxychloroquine early, even though technically just like Daniel Day Kim did. Now, would your average person who got sick get hydroxychloroquine from the doctor? No, they shouldn't get it because it's not even meant to be given that way outside the hospital. Rich people get to do rich things. Rich people and connected people get things faster, you know? Um, Amy asked, I've been on the front lines during 9-11. That was really out of control and beyond our comprehension. When do you think we'll be able to contain this? Yeah, Amy, you know, this is very different from 9-11. The problem is 9-11, was the equivalent of getting hit by a car real hard and spun around and you know all the damage is at once and you deal with the fallout later and yeah it changed everything it changed tsa 
and it changed the way we travel. It changed, you know, politics, war, and fabric of society, but not health wise. This is longer. I don't think we're going to get back. We don't have a normal that we're going to go back to anymore. I mean, think about it. When's the time you're going to feel comfortable to shake anybody's hand? I don't know. I'm not going to shake anybody's hand for at least till I know that a lot of people have the vaccine towards herd immunity. So I'm not planning on shaking anybody's hand for, and if that's normal, for like a year and a half, probably. That's kind of crazy if you think about it, that we're not going to shake hands anymore. You know, so um, yeah, so, uh, Greg mentions Fauci made the point that we never found a cure to HIV, but found really effective treatments. So that can be an option also if we never get a vaccine. Greg, that's a very good point. Now, remember with HIV, yeah, who was the most famous face of HIV? It was Magic Johnson, right? They made a funny episode about HIV where they said, you know, uh, the, the cure for HIV was money, right? Like Magic Johnson had all the money that's what cured it but it's really because they invented better and better drugs and better and better uh, uh antiretroviral therapy they had triple therapy they had different drugs that worked that way even Kaletra, which was one of the drugs that was initially studied for um uh covid19 and the problem with hiv was in the beginning they didn't know how it really spread and they never really had any drugs to uh fight it with and you're right you know, they didn't have a lot of, or they've never had really a success with vaccine. Um, I think there have been people, cases that have been cured lately. I forget how. But again, that took what? Like the first case of HIV were in the early 80s or even late 70s. So that took what? More than 30 years to cure it. COVID-19, we're going to have to mitigate it socially and then find drugs that will help. And uh, this is where I want to talk a little bit about one of the drugs I forgot to talk about, and it's not really a drug, but I've mentioned this a couple times, and <clears throat> it goes by two names. The medical name is IVIG, and the name that most people hear is plasma, right? So what is plasma? Let me just break it down medically, and maybe I'll end on this, and this will be some good food for thought. IVIG stands for IV intravenous IG. IG is antibodies. So where are those antibodies? Is it everything in your blood? No, no. You know, it's uh, you're, let's say you got COVID-19 and you're like, well, how can I help? I want to help somebody. I want to donate blood. I want to donate whatever. You will be screened by the blood bank. And I read a fascinating article about how this may be our saving grace. And this may be a way that we don't have to pay for expensive, you know, like remdesivir and other IV drugs. It, you know, there are thousands of dollars or whatever that plasma may be the way and what they do they will screen you and say when did you get you know COVID-19 and you say oh I got it like a week ago and and they'll say okay well you know you cannot donate blood blood products now you can donate it two weeks from now or whatever I think it's two weeks like 14 days after your last symptom and then you can go into the blood bank and then of course you do your blood thing if you ever donate a blood I've done it a few times not a ton but I've updated it and um you know you sit there and it comes out and then you get that bag but, but what a lot of people don't know they think that oh you can just give that as blood but you can spin it down and get different products if centrifuge it you'll see a layer you'll see the red packed red blood cells it's called packard blood cells they're packed down and they're just like really red and more dense looking and then have the stuff above it the layer above it is uh, a tiny, tiny layer, if you look at it, a film really, and then a yellow part above it. The yellow part of it is the plasma. And then the little film is a combination of white blood cells and platelets, white blood cells attack cells, platelets, and again, the plasma, the plasma is the stuff that will have the antibodies floating in it. And the idea is that, and I don't know how much, like whether one person, plasma can treat one other person's, um, uh, you know, one sick person. But my point is this may be the killer. In other words, the COVID, for all intents and purposes, the COVID killer, meaning that, well, maybe now it doesn't matter that everyone gets sick. If they do get sick, we just have bags and bags of, you know, donated plasma because everyone wants to make a difference if they can and they recovered and let's say they're younger and asymptomatic, then they don't care. They just need to donate one pint of, can you imagine if that's the answer for humanity? There's something poetic about it, right? 
that the way to beat this is by humanity really to sacrifice physically sacrifice their blood it there's something very poetic and i would love for it to happen but again what's going to be the problem productivity where is the the um where is the uh, bottleneck so to speak it's about setting up that delivery system to get first of all there's a lag of delay we the people who are covid positive that recovered so at the minimum they're going to need 14 more days some of these people to donate maybe some of the early ones who've recovered can but there's not many who've recovered right like even if i look at total recovered cases um uh uh you have to look at the uh I, I, I don't have the charts on me right now, but uh, the active is right now is still pretty high. The active cases in the U.S. is still somewhere near like um, 700,000 are currently still active. So there's se- oh, let me just do some quick math. So 700,000 are still active, and the U.S. had 790,000 cases. Now, what does that mean? That just means that there are 90,000 in the U.S. that have recovered. How much percentage again of the population? Let's just round it up to hundred thousand. That's nothing, right? Oh my God, that's really nothing. That's less. Than, um, that's less than point one percent. That's like point um oh three percent of America has recovered from coronavirus. So my is we don't have enough to make all that liquid gold. Um, uh, Gennady. So vampires are probably. Right now. <laughs> yeah, maybe Gennady. I mean, it would be a good time to be a vampire unless you run into Blade in the middle of a corn. I love the movies, by the way. I really miss all of that. So, uh, so anyway, I know, uh, mention about this Blood Boy thing. You know, I read this later. I, I don't have enough time to read this. Is it um, Blood Boy? Oh, you mean so a Blood Boy is. Like like for you, yeah, no, I mean, again, you know, what the thing is going to be, the sad thing is what can you, what can you predict is going to happen in terms of rich people and who get clapped? I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with I mean, you may get to people are worried and you could see kind of eggs right that's a couple of girlfriends not my girlfriends friends or girls who've donated eggs and how what did they get paid man they went through a painful everybody had eighty thousand dollars i mean and i mean but that's not like dudes you go like a dude to a sperm bank say i don't know for sure but let's say i don't think you get paid that much you know my point is there will come a point where if you can't get plasma fast enough, I bet you there will be people who will privately advertise to get plasma donated for money. You know, like let's say it'll probably be more money than the government gave you in a stimulus check. It's a really effed up world we're living in right now, right? Like this is the most, not the most, but it is a feasible mechanism of recovery. And again, no point to get plasma if you're mildly. There's no reason. You're just exposing yourself to risk with minimal benefit. You're already asymptomatic. You're going to recover. The point is the plasma is for the hospitalized patient. And that's maybe uh, the game changer. So maybe Gilead, maybe Roche, maybe Sanofi, maybe Johnson Johnson, all the people with the vaccines, if we can figure out the plasma harnessing and make that, it's sort of going to be like the new pot farm, you know, like, this could be a huge, huge thing, but I'm just not smart enough or rich enough connected to want to be part of it. And honestly, it's going to be cowboy, wild, wild west medicine in the beginning. Once again, you got to be careful what you wish for and what you sign up for. Let, there's a, a fancy uh, uh, one warning is that um, they tried to do something like this and uh, in HIV, China. They did some version of this with plasma where they're trying to give antibodies and uh, uh, or, or not, not HIV, I'm um, sorry. HIV is what happened. In China, they did this with something else for uh, plasma. Uh, I think it's for the swine flu or some other flu. Uh, they tried to do this plasma thing to treat China for it or SARS or something like that. 
And guess what happened? Because the quality control wasn't good at these plasma centers, they ended up infecting a whole ton of people with HIV because they didn't screen well for it. So my point is, is that we have to be careful. There's got to be some level of A, quality control, uh, B, effectivity, e effectivity, meaning that it works the way it's supposed to be, and C, some guidelines. Again, you, what's the point of giving all this plasma to your, you know, your 14-year-old pot-smoking nephew who basically was sick and doesn't need it and never had lung problems and never will, you know, for a while? You're wasting plasma. You know, that could be a use for a 75-year-old uh, end-stage lung disease person who is on oxygen that really needs it, you know? So anyway, that's it. I'll leave it on that. Um, and again, um, sorry about the late broadcast. Thank you everybody for sticking with me um, and asking these questions. Gennady, Andy, uh, Stephen, Amy, everyone, Greg, you guys out there. Uh, again, a little bit, this is a little bit my therapy. This is the first time I'm recording it um, on better quality uh, on my iPhone. I skipped Instagram because I, I think anyone's going to really join me for it. On uh, my Thursday broadcast, I'll be back to a normal time. I have a night shift tomorrow, and I get, um, I get uh, Thursday, Friday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to relax. So I'll be able to find a uh, 1 p.m. Uh, uh, broadcast, uh, Hawaii Standard Time. Uh, by the way, if you guys think there's a better time, I heard some people like 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard, 7 Pacific, or 10 p.m. Uh, 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 New York, but I just thought 1 p.m. was a little better for everyone. But if you guys like a different time, let me know and I'll try for that. Okay. So that's it again. Um, try, please go ahead and share this. Uh, like me at the traveling doctor, um, uh, on inst or, uh, at the traveling doctor on Twitter and, and search me the traveling doctor on YouTube or at the traveling underscore MD on Instagram or again, the traveling on Facebook. So, Stephen, anything you really need to get off your chest that you have? <laughs> Thanks. I don't know if you're joking or not, but I, I'm, I'm going to assume that you're not really being uh, trying to troll me. But um, uh, I guess I'll just say that, you know, it's funny being back actually working as a doctor again, um, truly in the hospital and seeing what some of the people are doing because it is really scary and again hawaii like i was very lucky i took care of zero covid i think i don't know i got a really sick patient today that might be covid by tomorrow i don't know but my point is is i i keep thinking how scary it is. i was on my, my shoes and putting on um my gown um and my hat and and my face shields and my goggles, I was thinking, my God, this is so slow to put it on and take it off. And I'm so scared and, and not scared, but you know, I'm concerned. I don't want to get too close to the patient, but we need to get close to him. And I'm like, oh my God, this is just like a rule out, not even a really sick patient. And I'm doing this. And I'm thinking of all my doctor friends, my poor doctor friends and nurses who I think are going to need a lot more therapy than I do, who are watching people die, who are holding up iPads, literally, to people to say goodbye because they cannot say goodbye or maybe they can't even hear good because they're in a ventilator. And I'm thinking how sad this is and how ashamed I am really of people in society that think that this doesn't matter at all and that this is somehow a hoax and this is all politically motivated. It's a big left wing scheme or, a, you know, even a big right wing scheme or a, it's Bill Gates or someone wants to make money off it. So, I mean, like the truth is, yeah, you know what? Someone's going to make money off this. The truth is, yeah, it will benefit somebody. It doesn't mean it's faked, that it's the biggest conspiracy and that people like me and my doctor friends are doing this and it's all total bullshit. Like, it's just not. And like, that's what I want to get off my chest. It only really became salient to me this time uh, when I'm really in the hospital and I'm like, oh my God, I, I think maybe I did get it, but if I didn't, I don't want to get it now, you know? So yeah, so uh, I, okay. So stay uh, thanks. Uh, I, I will save this on my Facebook again and on my YouTube. Much better quality because I'm uh, cameraing it on my iPhone now. And uh, thank you so much. So I'll keep it. I'll try to keep it the later time. I'll shoot to 4 p.m. Um, but I cannot do the 8 p.m. time all the time because I tend to get a lot more people who want me to do the 4 p.m. as opposed to 8 p.m. But maybe I'll switch back next time on Thursday to 4 p.m. Hawaii standard for now. So, 
So 4 p.m. Uh, Hawaii, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific, and 10 p.m. Uh, uh, Eastern time. So again, everyone stay safe. Hope we have some good news. Again, I'll summarize. Antibody tests are only as good as their sensitivity. I wouldn't expect any good ones now. Remdesivir looks okay, but we don't know. Plasma is going to be really, really important for us. The production of it is going to be hard. And, and the other take-home point is we're starting to see bad cases of the second wave. Look at Singapore and Japan. Look at their curves. They are hitting their second wave hard right now. It does not look good. It looks ugly. I hate to end on that note. But for our states in the U.S., you look at Georgia and Florida because they are opening up and kind of running into phase one slash phase two. So New York was our canary in our cold mine for how bad it can be. And Georgia and Florida are going to be our canary in our cold mine too for how bad our second wave can be because they're going to hit their second wave in a way first, you know. So everyone, um, yeah, uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks you for letting me unload and helping you. Uh, again, this is a traveling doctor signing off. You can search for me on Facebook. YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, okay? Guys, stay safe out there. Aloha, and thank you so much, okay?